We've covered the basics of derivations using only four rules, modus ponens, modus tollens, double negation, and repetition. And these are actually the rules for the negation as well as the conditional. So what we're missing are our basic rules for conjunction, disjunction, and biconditional. And that's what we'll learn now. In general, rules come in two types, elimination rules and introduction rules. Elimination rules allow us to remove the main connective of the sentence in question. For example, if we have a conditional statement, an elimination rule will allow me to get at the parts of the conditional, like an antecedent and a, and a consequent. And we'll see more examples of elimination rules coming up. Introduction rules allow us to build sentences, build bigger sentences out of smaller parts. So I could use an introduction rule to build, say, an and statement or an or statement. As we move forward, elimination rules are almost always considered automatic moves. They're moves that are basically good to be, to be done whenever you want to, and uh, you don't really have to think too hard about doing them. So keep in mind the distinction between elimination and introduction as we go forward. So our first two rules that we're going to learn uh, for our new connectives are simplification and adjunction. So these are the rules for the conjunction, so for the and symbol. Let's look at simplification first. Simplification is an elimination rule. It says, if I have phi and psi, so if I know that that is true, well then I can infer from that either one or the other side. It doesn't actually matter. So if I know phi and psi, I can just conclude phi, or I can conclude psi, and that would be an example of eliminating and as the main connective to get at the parts. The adjunction rule, ADJ, is the introduction rule for AND. So what that means is I can build up a conjunction sentence from smaller parts. So if I know phi and I also know psi, well it stands to reason that I can conclude phi and psi. Of course I can also conclude psi and phi. Disjunction uh, also has an elimination and an introduction rule. The elimination rule for the OR is called modus tollendo ponens, or MTP for short. Now, modus tollendo ponens is a very simple application of the rule. If I have an or statement, like phi or psi, and I have not one, well then I can conclude the other. That is actually just what or means in our regular common language. So if I have phi or psi, and I have not phi, I conclude psi, or if I have not psi, I can conclude phi. Addition uh, is also for sort of an obvious rule from our English language, and it's the introduction rule for or. It's how I would build an OR statement. Now, in conjunction case, when I used adjunction, I actually needed both parts to build a conjunction, and that makes sense. I need to know phi as well as psi to build the statement phi and psi. But for disjunction, it turns out you don't need that. You only need one part. If I know the statement phi is true, then I can conclude phi or psi, or I can conclude psi or phi. The order doesn't matter. Now, this is obvious, but it's sort of a weird one when you think about it. That means from the statement, my name is Alex, which is true, I can also conclude any disjunction statement and affirm that that statement is true as well. I can conclude, my name is Alex, or the moon is made of green cheese. That is true. I can also conclude, uh, today is Tuesday, or my name is Alex. And that's true, even if today is not Tuesday. And the reason why is because a disjunction is true if at least one of its sides are true. And just because I know that my name is Alex, I can pair it with anything I want in an OR statement, and that statement is true. So the last two rules that we'll learn are the elimination and introduction for the biconditional. And these are pretty straightforward as well. Biconditional conditional lets us eliminate a biconditional and move to a conditional statement. So if I know phi biconditional psi, I can actually infer either direction of the conditional. The introduction rule for the biconditional lets us go from both directions of a conditional, and then we can infer the biconditional itself. And again, this should make sense because the biconditional means a conditional in both directions. So if I know phi arrow psi as well as psi arrow phi, I can conclude the biconditional phi biconditional psi or flip the sides around, and it's no problem. So you could ask, how do we eliminate the conditional? How do we introduce the conditional? Uh, well, it turns out we actually know these rules already. Uh, modus ponens and modus tollens are both elimination rules for the conditional. After all, we start with the conditional statement, and then we are able to access one of its parts. How do we introduce a conditional? 
This is actually a little different. There is no rule that allows us to introduce a conditional. Instead, what we actually do is when we want a conditional, we show the conditional. We write show phi arrow psi, and we start a conditional derivation. And that allows us to introduce a conditional statement. What about negation? Well, negation we actually just only sort of introduce singly when we do an indirect derivation and assume IDs. That's really the only place where you can ever put in a negation. Really understanding the difference between elimination and introduction in terms of our rules is very helpful. Elimination rules are going to be automatic moves, and that's really important. But introduction rules are also very important because they reveal proof structure. And proof structure is very helpful in figuring out what it is that we should do. So what this means is that if I actually want to show, for example, an AND statement in a, a conjunction like phi AND psi, proof structure lets me know what to do. I need to show both sides. First I should show phi, then I should show psi. And I can do these entirely separately. Of course, it doesn't matter which order you do them in, as long as you show both. The reason why is because if I want phi and psi, I can now use my and introduction rule, which is adjunction. If I have both parts, I can conclude the and statement, and that's how I would proceed. Now, the introduction for or also sort of is quite revealing in terms of structure of a derivation too. The reason why is if I want to build the or statement, phi or psi, because I want to show phi or psi, uh, I know that all I really need is one side, because if I have one side, I can just add to it using the addition rule, the other side, and get the disjunction that I want. So that's actually really nice. I don't need to show both sides of a disjunct. I only need to show one and then use the proper introduction rule. For the biconditional, again, the, in, the introduction rule for the biconditional reveals the structure of the proof. If I need to show phi biconditional psi, I know then that I need to show the conditional in both directions. So once I show the conditional in both directions, then I am able to um, join those both directions using the rule conditional to biconditional, and I get the biconditional I wanted all along. Now, don't forget, part of proof structure is knowing how to deal with just conditionals and just regular old statements like phi. But this is where uh, we sort of looked at from before. A conditional, we do conditional derivation. Anything else, we always do an assume ID. This is our first derivation with all 10 basic rules available to us. In this derivation, we'll sort of use the rules, but we'll also think about structure and some other tricks that will help us through uh, navigating this derivation. So again, a derivation always starts with a show line, and the show is always the ultimate goal of what we want. This is the conclusion of our argument, and we want to show it follows from the truth of the premises. Now, um, when I look around here, it's not so obvious anymore how I start. So what I'm going to suggest is that we start with automatic moves above anything else. Is there something I can just do that makes perfect sense immediately from my premises? And the answer is yes. Premise 1 is a conditional, so I'm just going to flag that for later. Uh, I know that I'm going to try and modus ponens or modus tollens it. Premise 2 is a conjunction. Well, that's nice. I know what to do with that. Premise 3 is a disjunction, and there's only one rule I can use with a disjunction. That's modus tollendo ponens. I'm not going to worry about these two. I'm going to focus on the conjunction, and I know that what I can immediately do is simplify a conjunction. If I ever have an AND statement, I can simplify both sides so that I get at its parts. And this is, of course, the uh, AND simplification rule. Sorry, the AND elimination rule, I should say. Premise to simplify. OK, so now what do I do? Well, is there anything else automatic I can do? Not really. I have a bicondition over here, and I have an ugly negation over here. So there's nothing really I can do. At this point, I need to look at the structure of the proof to help me out. And the structure of the proof is always revealed by your most recent show line. Here, I need to show Z or P arrow W. But what I should realize is that I only need to show one half. To show a disjunction, I just need to show one side of the disjunction, and then I'll be able to add the other side. So what should I try and show? Should I try and show Z, or should I try and show P arrow W? Well, look around. I hope it's crystal clear that showing Z is a bad move. Z doesn't appear anywhere in my premises. It's almost sort of like a red herring, just there to get in the way. 
So I'm not going to show Z. Instead, I will focus on showing P arrow W. And once I realize that's what I want to show, I write it down. Show P arrow W. OK. So whenever I write a show line, I go to show line breakdown techniques. What did I just write? I wrote the show of a conditional. So that means I immediately start on a conditional derivation. I have P, which is assume CD. And now I actually want to show W. And on line 7, I could say not W. And I'm doing an assume ID. This is nice. It's a mixed derivation. And it just sort of works really nice and easy. Now, it sort of looks troubling because I have three open show lines. But remember, we only use the one that we're working on right now. And all the other lines are just available lines. So two is available, three is available, and five is available because they are uh, unboxed and they're not show lines. OK, so this just gave me a couple extra nice parts to work with. And so the question is, can I do anything with these parts? Well, I already sort of tackled premise two, so I'm not going to look there. Premise one, I need a P and not R, or I need a T, sorry, negation T. Oh, well, OK, this is sort of interesting. It looks like I can do something with premise three. Premise three, it says not P or not R. So what I'm looking to do is find the negation of one side. Because modus to lend opponent says, if I have an or statement, and if I know not one of them, then I do know the other. And of course, I do have the negation of one side. One side of the disjunction is not P, but over here I have P. And of course, if I double negate that, that is the negation of one side. So I will actually take this a little slow. I'll take line five and double negate it. And then I will use line eight now to modus to lend opponents with this premise. And if I have the negation of one side, then the other side must be true. So I get not R from eight premise three MTP. Okay, so that's nice. That just gives me not R. And what does not R give me? Well, I look around. Is there an R anywhere? Yeah, there's an R right here. P and not R arrow T. Well, a, con a conditional, I can only modus ponens or modus tollens. So can I get the antecedent? Do I have P and not R? Sort of. I have P over here. I have not R over here. If I want to build the antecedent, that would mean that I want to introduce an AND statement. And if I have both sides, I can conclude that P and not R. How? 5, 9, adjoin, A, D, J. And of course, this will let me modus ponens to get T. So that's 10, premise 1, modus ponens. OK, now what? Well, we just need to ask, what does the T actually give me? Well, uh, I sort of dealt with premise one, premise two, premise three. OK, what haven't I dealt with? Oh, well, I haven't actually addressed line, um, line two at all. And line two is a biconditional that says S biconditional T. So how do I make use of it? Well, I actually want to split it up. And the question is, which way do I split it? Well, it doesn't really matter. If you're not sure, split it both ways. But here, I'm going to split it into T arrow S. And that is 2 biconditional to conditional, which of course is the elimination line for a biconditional. So I've eliminated the biconditional and replaced it with conditional. This is nice because 11 and 12 clearly combine using a modus ponens. That's an automatic move. And I get 11, 12 modus ponens to get S. Whew, OK, so after all this, I have S. Now, there's only one line on the board that I haven't used, and it's this one. And this is sort of a weird line. It's the negation of a conjunction, negation P and S. So I can't really do anything with this. But remember, what I'm trying to find is a contradiction. So a nice contradiction with negation P and S would just be if I had P and S. And of course, I can build that because I have P in line 5 s in line 13. So I end up getting p and s. That's line 5 and 13. And I adjoin those. Now, in order to finish the proof, I have to get my contradiction. Now, a contradiction always has to be within the box that you're currently working. So this is where we use the strange repeat rule. What I'm going to do is I will now repeat uh, not P and S 
uh, using line three, repeat. The reason why is because now I can say, look, on line 15 and on line 14, I have a perfect contradiction. ID. That means I've immediately showed my most recent box, sorry, my most recent show line, I can cross it off and I'm done. Before I finish the proof, I'm just going to go over those last couple steps clearly. I generated P and S. The reason why was because I knew I wanted it to contradict with line 3. But before I would do the contradiction, I always need to bring it within the current show that I'm working on. Then I noted that line 14 and line 15 are opposites, they're contradictory. They are of the form phi and not phi. Here it just happens that they're complicated, P and S, not P and S. And again, notice they have nothing to do with W and that's fine. Under the assumption that W was false, I got a contradiction. So that means I can reject that assumption and W must be true. That's what we did. Now, I'm not done. I still need to close the rest of my shows to get my final proof. Now, if I have show P arrow W, I assumed the antecedent. Did I successfully show the consequent? Yes. So I can say on line six, I did a conditional derivation and I did successfully show that from the assumption of the antecedent P, that W followed, hence P arrow W is true. Now, the finish of this requires me to remember the structure. I wanted to show P arrow W. Why? Well, because what I really wanted to show was this Z or P arrow W. So I showed one disjunct, and now I can add to it anything I want. So I will say Z or bracket P arrow W. How did I get this? I took line uh, four and I added to it anything I wanted, which was Z. Because notice line four is an available line because the show is crossed off. This is where proof structure tells me what to do. Now I finish the proof by saying, hey look, this is a direct derivation. This is exactly what I wanted. So I can cross that off and box all of this. This is certainly a more sophisticated proof than what we've seen before, and I hope you can see how I used a mixture of elimination rules and introduction rules and proof structure to help me sort of get through it. If this seems sort of overwhelming, try and take it one step at a time. Remember that what I did here was essentially just did a lot of automatic breakdowns, and I used proof structure to help me out. Those are the 10 basic rules of derivations in sentential logic. All the rules should seem very intuitively correct and not sort of confusing in any way. On top of the rules, we've learned how to uh, do a derivation using proper structure and form and three different types of derivations which reflect three different types of reasoning that we do in everyday language. Uh, remember some of the key differences, for example, the difference between an elimination rule and an introduction rule, and ultimately, don't forget that rules need to be applied literally. We have to always consider what the main connective is, and we can't deviate from the rule structure. Now, when you're sort of doing this, you might sort of wonder what it is that we're exactly doing. Don't forget that at all times what we're doing is we're trying to show that from the truth of the premises of an argument that the conclusion follows. We're trying to show that an argument is valid. Our derivation system is powerful enough to prove everything that we would want to in first order logic. Now one thing that does come up are tautologies, and a tautology is something, if you recall, is true no matter what. So if something is true no matter what, we should be able to prove it from any set of premises, including no premises. And these are theorems. So a theorem is a tautology in logic that we can do, uh, we can show is valid. Uh, using a zero premise proof. So from nothing, we should be able to show that a theorem follows. Now, uh, using theorems in our logical system is really important, and practicing deriving theorems is very helpful because it focuses on certain skills. So one really important skill that we will make use of often when doing theorem proofs is that of contradiction generators. So sometimes in a proof, I'll encounter the negation of something. So here's an example of a negation of a conditional, not bracket P arrow Q or R. The main connective of the sentence is a negation, and there's nothing I can do to it. 
notice, think, our, think about our 10 basic rules. Our 10 basic rules are about our four main connectives, and then we have double negation and repeat. But none of them actually allow us to eliminate a negation. That's actually impossible as far as we're concerned. So when I see a sentence like this, there's nothing I can do with it. In fact, it's almost like a dead end. However, there is one thing that it is useful for, which is to be a contradiction generator. What I mean is it would be really nice if I had P arrow Q or R. Why? Because if I was able to show P arrow Q or R, then that would immediately contradict with the negation of P arrow Q or R, and I would be able to prove whatever it is that I'm trying to prove. So if I want P arrow Q or R, the only way to get it is to show it. So when you have a, the negation of something, think that it's a contradiction generator, and I can just show the non-negated version of it, and that will help me get out of jams. This line of thinking can be used in general. The idea is very straightforward. If you're stuck, always ask what would be really useful, and then show it. So things that are really useful are uh, the unnegated versions. That's a contradiction generator. But other things that are really useful are things that allow us to use our rules. So antecedents of conditionals are really useful because if we had an antecedent, uh, I could then use modus ponens. Similarly, the negation of a consequent of a conditional would be really useful to have because then I could use modus tollens. Negation of uh, disjunctions are also really useful because then I can use modus tollens opponents and so on. So and a very important skill that you'll develop when you do a lot of theorems is the ability to get unstuck. Uh, this requires practice, but you always just need to ask, what would be useful if I had? And then show that thing. This is theorem 63. Therefore, P and Q by conditional negation, bracket, negation P or negation Q, close bracket. Turns out this theorem has a special name, which we'll learn later on, but let's not worry about it for now. Notice that there are no premises, so I have to show this without actually having the aid of any premises. And as you'll see, this is going to sort of lead to an oddity right off the bat. So here we go, P and Q by conditional not, not P or not Q. Always write your show line. Now take a moment here to realize that the main connective here is the by conditional, and we'll talk about that in a second. Now, what I should realize is that I actually have absolutely nothing to do right now. I have no premises to work with, so I can't do any automatic moves. Now, I could do an assume ID, but I'm not going to, and there's a reason why. I should realize that this is a biconditional. So, when I do a biconditional proof, if I have to show phi biconditional psi, what I really need to do is I need to show one way, and then I need to show the other, and then I will do a conditional by conditional move to get what I want. That's what my proof is going to look like. And so knowing that, I actually can just start smartly using proof structure. So instead of showing this by conditional or doing something strange, I'm just going to immediately try and show one way, P and Q, arrow negation, not P or not Q. It's really important that you identify the main connective properly. If you thought the main connective was and or something else, this proof is going to look entirely different and probably won't work. The biconditional is the main connective, tells me how to split it this way, and now I can proceed. You should also note that this is going to be a really long proof, uh, but that's okay. I'll try and use lots of abbreviations to uh, sort of shorten it as much as I can. Now, I look at my most recent show line. I know it is a uh, conditional. So I will start a conditional derivation, and I will just show the, con the consequent, not P or not Q. Now, I've just shown something that is not a conditional. It's nothing I recognize, so I will immediately start an assume ID. And assume ID, which is an indirect derivation, lets me assume this. Now, this is really nice because suddenly, out of nothing, I've generated two available lines that I can use, 3 and 5. And in fact, I can actually do more, because 3 simplifies really nicely to P. Uh, that is an automatic move, and I have Q, that is also an automatic move. Why? Because if I have a conjunction, I can just look to eliminate the AND. Now what do I do? Well, I just stare at what I have, and it's actually pretty straightforward. 
6, or 7 for that matter, can combine with line 5 to get a modus to lend opponents. So how do I do that? I'll take my P, I double negate it, and then modus to lend opponents, because if I ha don't have one, then I must have the other. And I can infer not Q. So that's 6, double negate, line 5, modus to lend opponents. And now I can say, hey look, on line 7 and 8, I have an indirect derivation. That's a contradiction, so I can box and close, and I've successfully shown negation, negation P or negation Q. Now why did I want to show that? Well, I just look up to remind myself. I wanted to show the conditional. I was able to show that under the assumption of the antecedent that the consequent followed, so I can jettison my assumption, and on line 10, I'll say, hey, on line 4, I successfully did a conditional derivation. I showed the consequent. No problem. So now if I'm sort of watching my checklist, I've actually done this. I've shown one way. And it actually didn't take so long, so maybe this proof isn't as long as I thought. Now, of course, I need to show the other way. So what I need to show is negation, bracket, negation P or negation Q, arrow, P and Q. Twelve. I will assume the antecedent. Thirteen. I will show the consequent, P and Q. Now, I'm not so sure what to do with this, but when all else fails, I can always start with an assume ID, and that's generally a good thing to do. Oops, I forgot to write in my assume CD. I'll do it right now. So again, my proof sort of opens up in the same way. I now have the available lines 12 and 14. What about this stuff up here? Actually, it's no good. I can't use any of this stuff up here anymore because these are unavailable lines. In fact, the only available lines that I have are 2, 12, and 14. So what do I do now? Well, unfortunately, this is sort of a pain. Uh, line 2 is useless. It's just one side of the con biconditional. So I focus on line 12 and 14. The issue is, I can't do anything. In my previous subderivation, I was just able to simplify and immediately do moves. But here, I can't do anything. The negation is the main connective of both lines, which means I can't use any of my rules. I can't simplify this, I can't MTP, I'm just totally stuck, and this is a problem. Often, when you solve theorems, one direction of the biconditional is much easier than the other. This is the harder direction, and it looks like I'm a bit stuck. So when I'm stuck, I think about two things to get unstuck, proof structure and contradiction generators, what would be nice to have, and so on. So I'm going to invoke a bit of proof structure. If I want to show P and Q, well then, I can sort of write it out here. If I want to show alpha and beta, I really need to show alpha, and I need to show beta, and then I can join these using uh, a join, and that is my proof. So that's what I'm going to do. First, I'm going to show P. And on line 16, I get not P as an assume ID. How did I know to show P? Because I want to show P and Q, so I need to show both sides. Now what can I do with this not P? It doesn't look like I can do anything. I can't actually combine it anywhere. But it turns out there is one really nice thing I can do, and that's because line 12 is a contradiction generator. Not bracket, not P or not Q. What would be really nice is if I had not P or not Q. But how do I get this? Well. I actually just need one side. I either need not P or I need not Q. I just need one of them. And if I have one, I can build this. So notice I do have the not P. And so that means I can just immediately add to it anything I want in the form of a disjunction. So 16 A, D, D. Why is this nice? Well, look, line 12 is, in fact, the opposite of line 17. So what I can write is on line 17 and line 12 repeated, I have an indirect derivation and I've successfully shown P. So this was proof structure and a contradiction generator built into one nice move. And if I'm keeping track, I have just done this step here. I've showed alpha. So now on line 19, I'm going to do the same thing, except I'm going to show uh, Q. And that's this over here. 
So let's do a little highlighting to make this clear. This is my alpha over here. And this, now I'm trying to show Q, which is represented over here by beta. And that's this over here. And the P was this over here. Okay, well, so now I know how to proceed. I get not Q, that's an AID. And then on line 21, I take my not Q and I pretty much do the same move. I get not P or not Q, 20 add. And then on line 22, I can say, hey, look, that's line 21, 12 repeat ID for the exact same reason that I was able to show P, I can show Q. Now, what I can do is I've done this. Now I do the ADJ line, which is P and Q. And that is line 15, 19, AD, uh, J. And now I can say on line 23, I did a direct derivation. I wanted P and Q, I got P and Q, cross off, box, done. Now before I go on, I'm just going to point something out. I didn't use the assume ID. That's fine. I did a mixed derivation. I started with an indirect derivation and I finished with a direct. But you could have used the assume ID. Instead of closing this as direct, I could have said, hey, wait, 23 actually does contradict with line 14. That's an indirect derivation. Either is fine. Just do whichever one that you happen to see first. Why did I want P and Q? Because P and Q is the consequent. So I wanted to show from the assumption of my antecedent that the consequent follows. So now I can say, hey, look, on line uh, 13, I did a conditional derivation. Box close. Now I'm not done. Again, keeping track, I've just done this. So ooh, I'm going to run out of colors here. So here, this is one way. That's this one. And this is the other way. That's this one. And so now I need to do my conditional by conditional move. So on line 26, I can say, okay, what I can now conclude is P and Q by conditional negation, not P or not Q. And what's that? The annotation for that will be line two, line 11, conditional to by conditional. And then finally, I can say direct derivation, because that is exactly what I wanted up here. And I close this. OK, so that's a pretty long derivation, but it's important because it shows you several tricks. First off, in the theorem, there's no premises, but we can gain available lines by doing proper show line and structure breakdown. Secondly, one part of a of a theorem by conditional is typically easier than another. This is the easy, this is the hard. And then last, uh, we are able to use things like contradiction generators and proof structure to really help us get unstuck in a complicated derivation. That's the basics of derivations. We have all our rules. Uh, we understand how to break down show lines. We know structure, all sorts of things. And really, it boils down to five general skills that you really want to master to be good at derivations. First, you need to know how to break down show lines. And breaking down show lines is easy. If it's a conditional, you do a conditional derivation. If it's anything else, you do an assume ID. You need to know what automatic moves are, and you need to apply them automatically. Automatic moves are typically your elimination rules that just get rid of things. If you have a conjunction, simplify it. If you can do a modus ponens, you do a modus ponens. Proof structure is also very important, and these are our introdu introduction rules at work. So a proof structure will let us know, for example, that if I want to show an and statement, I should show both sides, or if I want to show an or, I should just show one side, and so on. Now the last two skills are the ones that take practice. Contradiction generators are really helpful when we're stuck, and we realize that somewhere in my proof I have the negation of something and I can't do anything to it. If that's the case, I want to show the unnegated form. And in general, uh, this can be used to get unstuck if I have nowhere to go. And I see that on a line, for example, I have a conditional. Well, one thing to get me unstuck would be to show the antecedent so I could then modus ponens. And this showing something useful is the hardest uh, skill 
to master when you're doing derivations. That takes us to the end of the basic introduction to derivations. You have your 10 rules, your three derivation types, and all sorts of information on how to successfully complete derivations. Now you might have some lingering questions about what's going on here. Never forget that we are trying to just show that an argument is valid, and our reasoning is just meant to be applications of the most basic argument patterns using our five logical connectives. The things that we do all the time in regular English, and as well, the sort of structure of a derivation reflects how we would argue in regular English as well. What we're doing is we're just doing a very formal way a presentation, if you will, of such an argument that would show that from the truth of the premises, the conclusion follows. Now, there are lots of other interesting things we could ask about our derivation system. Do we need all the rules? Uh, actually, it turns out we don't. We can actually do every single proof with just two rules. We don't need ten. Uh, and that's sort of an interesting fact that we'll discuss in class. You may also wonder how it is that we can actually prove anything that we want to once we have a contradiction. Really, this is just asking how is it that assumption ID and an indirect derivation actually work? Uh, it seems sort of like magic. Well, it's not really magic. It's actually just short form. Uh, it turns out that we can use modus tollendo ponens uh, as a very basic rule to always show that from a contradiction we can generate the statement that we want. Uh, it's just that this is so commonly known that we are just allowed to shortcut it using ID. Uh, so if you're curious about this, I'll go over this in class. Uh, it is worth pointing out, though, that there is sort of a legacy of discussion whether or not indirect derivations are actually legitimate, uh, and this goes back to intuitionistic philosophies of mathematics and logic, uh, but for our purposes, and really the currently accepted view, is that indirect derivation and contradictions are no problem. So there might be some lingering questions in the derivation section, uh, but fundamentally you have enough to do the proofs themselves, and that's what I want you to practice.